Welcome to The Less Stressed Life, all about making this your time to feel freaking awesome about your life, health, and happiness. This podcast of The Less Stressed Life is hosted by Krista Bigler. Krista is an integrative registered dietitian nutritionist who specializes in reducing food-related stress, inflammation, and symptoms of food sensitivities. To learn more, visit lessstresslife.com. Okay, so today on The Less Stressed Life, we have Dr. Don Wattenhofer. Dr. Don is my optometrist, and I'm really excited to bring her here today to talk about some things that she's been teaching us over the last few years. But first, she's been practicing optometry in the Black Hills of South Dakota for the last two decades. She graduated from Pacific University College of Optometry in Oregon and owns Vision Source Optometry Clinic in Rapid City, South Dakota. So if you're on your way to Mount Rushmore, you can stop in and have your eyes checked on the way by. So welcome, Don. Thank you. So why I had you come on today was because the last time I was in, I was having, so I'll just give the background. I realized that I was having some issues with my vision where I couldn't see the TV guide in our living room. And this had happened to me a long time ago when I spent a lot, a lot of time on the computer. My um, vision was really suffering and I was able to kind of reverse it through I, moving away from where I lived. It was I don't know, I was having allergy issues there, um, some different eye vitamins. And I, we just got to talking about, you gave me some really awesome options. I've got some like special glasses for my computer. And I got to thinking about how lifestyle and your eyes are also this stressed area in our lives. And like we take, obvious, we take our senses for granted, right? We take our vision for granted, but it's such a big deal to preserve it as long as possible. And so I just wanted you to come on and share today a little bit about some of the big issues in vision care today and some of the, I think you're a very progressive optometrist and I'll just give you a little background on that too. I don't know if someone will resonate. When I was a child, I had an amazing optometrist. And then when I went to college, I didn't really know the differences between like a good and a bad one. So I saw someone who wasn't great. And when I came to you, I was so impressed by um, the things that you did for our family. So I wanted you to share some of the progressive things um, that you've done. So just to start out, um, what are some of the big issues in vision care today? Well, um, you made a really good point of, as far as us taking our vision for granted. We kind of, um, most of us can just see. And so we go around doing that and the vision can be causing a lot of strain, even in the head and the neck and the back and all over. So it is a good thing to think about as far as reducing stress. Um, as far as today, there are a couple of things going on. Uh, the baby, baby boomers are aging, so we're seeing a lot more eye disease like cataracts, diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration, glaucoma, and those kinds of things. Um, and then as far as other ages, computer digital eye strain, we call it, um, or computer vision syndrome, and that has to just do with a lot of discomfort, asthenopia, we call it. So just the eyes feeling tired and being stressed. And then we have the youth stuff where um, myopia or nearsightedness is increasing uh, by leaps and bounds. And so um, we're trying to figure out what are we doing to cause this? What can we do to help this? Because if um, more of the population becomes nearsighted, and if more of that nearsighted population has a very uh, large amount of myopia, there's more eye diseases associated with that, especially as they age. So for these younger kids, if, if we're going to have this great increase in myopia, we're going to see a lot more eye diseases coming with that down the road. And, and they can have irreversible vision loss. So it is a big deal. Okay. So myopia is uh, nearsightedness. If we leave that untreated, you could get one of, is it possible to get these other issues like glaucoma and macular degeneration, or do you mean different ones? No, that's exactly right. Because with, with myopia, the eyeball grows longer and then the internal tissues get stretched. And that just is associated with higher incidences of eye diseases like macular degeneration and glaucoma retinal tears and detachments, um, and things like that. So, 
And is glaucoma when you see you, it's like all cloudy? Um, it can have a generalized clouding to us to it. The most common thing would be that you develop blind spots in your peripheral vision. And so people actually don't have symptoms of glaucoma. If they do, they're pretty late stage and we don't want people to get there. So we do a really good job of screening for glaucoma every year. Um, if a patient it looks suspicious, we throw in extra testing so that we catch it really, really early. And today's technology has allowed us to even start catching that earlier, which is good because we don't know how to cure glaucoma. We only know how to slow it down. So the sooner we catch it, the more time we have to prevent uh, vision loss from it. How do you slow it down? Pardon? How do you slow it down? Reducing the eye pressure. And we are starting to know that the eye pressure is not the only thing going on in glaucoma. There's a lot going on there, but it continues to be the only thing that we have that we really know works for treatment. So no matter what a patient's pressure is to start with, if it's really high, mid or low, reducing that eye pressure still helps slow the progression of glaucoma. How do you reduce eye pressure? (laughs) These are very baby questions. Uh, No, it's great. Um, We typically start with eye drops. Um, There's a couple, well, several different eye drops that can reduce eye pressure. Patients might have to use them once a day, twice a day. Sometimes if we're having trouble getting the pressure low enough to slow the progression, we'll have to have patients on several drops, different types of medications throughout the day. There are some eye surgeries where you can have some lasers laser treatments done to certain parts of the eye where the, where the fluids are made or drain out. And those are effective. They aren't considered the first line of treatment, but they're, they're kind of getting there. So especially if we have a patient that looks really suspicious for glaucoma and maybe has a lot of risk factors and their pressure's up kind of high, they can have a laser procedure and that's probably going to reduce their pressure for at least two years with no other treatments. So sometimes it helps us buy time. And like I was saying before, buying time with glaucoma is kind of what we do. Mm -hmm. So macular degeneration, I've only heard about people talking about this and in the sense of, oh, I have genetic um, predisposition to getting macular degeneration. Um, They've looked at their genetics and whatever. So can you give us just a little background on what that is and what people do with that? Yeah, genetics are definitely a part of really most of this, most of this eye stuff, but um, there's a strong genetic predisposition to macular degeneration. Um, That one, that one's interesting too, because there's a lot of lifestyle factors. So um, the way that we eat and exercise, um, light exposure, you know, there's a lot of other things that we can do for macular degeneration. Uh, One huge one is smoking. That's a huge risk factor for macular degeneration. And uh, BMI, we'll kind of use the body mass index as a, you know, that's some, those are things that people can change to really help um, their outcomes, you know, or prevention for macular degeneration. What is macular degeneration? If I'm getting macular degeneration, what's going on for me? Um, Blurring or loss of central vision. So remember, glaucoma kind of affects more of the peripheral stuff. Uh, Macular degeneration affects the macula, which is the very central part of the retina where we get detail vision. So whenever you're looking directly at something, um, the words on your computer, your child's face, the clock on the wall, those different things, you're aiming your macula right at that area. And so when that area degenerates, you develop a central blind spot. So especially, you know, as the disease goes along, you'll have more central vision loss. So sometimes people can't read anymore. Um, Of course, it depends on how severe it gets. But do you see that occurring younger now? Or is it always about the same? Like when is the average onset of of these couple of conditions, would you say? Um, Well, yeah, they definitely become more prevalent uh, throughout the decades. Um, 40s would be pretty rare. Uh, we definitely start being more concerned and watching more for these things in the 50s and 60s and on. Uh, For example, 
a lot of times with my patients, 50s and up, I'll be asking them to do dilated retinal exams a lot more often. Before that, it can be more periodic, depending on what other things that they have going on. But after the, after that 50 year mark, we're looking more. Okay. So we talked a little bit about nearsightedness or myopia earlier, and you were sharing with me recently about, well, basically with our oldest daughter, we're doing some interesting progressive things to try to curb her nearsightedness. So she's not getting worse. She has glasses and she wears contacts, but she's not getting any worse. But if you could share a little bit about where this research comes from, and my understanding is that myopia is pretty rough in Asia, right? Can you explain that a little bit more? Yes, um, they're having a real epidemic in East Asia, where it used to be, you know, like a handful of decades ago, maybe 15% of their population was nearsighted. And uh, now in the, the teens and young adults, it can be north of 90%. So um, a lot of nearsightedness there. Even in the United States and Europe, um, we're getting to be around 50%, whereas it used to be 30%. So uh, lots of changes in nearsightedness, um, lots of theories on why this is happening. Uh, definitely, we know genetics play a part in it, but that is not all. The way we use our eyes is proving to play a part in this as well. So all the up-close work and um, and then the indoor time that's associated with that. There's something to do with light, natural light specifically, that helps um, slow the transition from not being nearsighted to being nearsighted. So uh, we're finding with studies that children that spend more time outside, uh, you know, as a whole, that group of people are less nearsighted than, than children who don't. So outdoor time is, is proving very important. Okay. So it's really high. It's like 90% of the population you said um, for East Asia and genetics are a factor, but certainly lifestyle and really up close work and computer work is really becoming the problem. So they've been doing a lot of research. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. It's a um, important market to get after because of all the blinding type eye diseases that can happen later on if you have a uh, very nearsighted eye. Okay. So when I was growing up, before I had LASIK, I thought I was pretty darn blind. I mean, my prescription, and if you never had glasses before, this won't make any sense. And honestly, it doesn't really make that much sense to me. <laughs> but, you know, my prescription was, I believe, a negative four and a half or a negative 4.75. And you recently said to me that the prescriptions are ridiculous in East Asia, right? They can be, yes. So um, that's what I was saying. In addition to a lot more people having nearsightedness, the amount of nearsightedness is going up. So when you get um, above three diopters even, definitely higher is worse. But when you, when you even get above a minus three diopters, you're going to start seeing more of the eye diseases that can be associated with a nearsighted eye. Okay. So to help with this, there's probably different options, right? But to help with this in our own family, you helped Natalie by just using a hack, like a hack, I would say, right? Kind of, it feels like it. Uh, it's like, Hey, you could use this and it will, it will change how you're using the eye. You want to explain kind of what you did for her? Yes. Um, there's a, I'll go back and kind of set the stage. There's a few different ways to, um, slow the progression of nearsightedness. Um, that we've been able to, to figure out. And um, one of them is called CRT lenses. And those are hard contact lenses that are fit um, too flat. They're actually fit too flat on the eye. So when a patient is wearing those, they're gently flattening out the cornea. So what they do is they sleep in the lenses overnight. Then they take them out in the, mor in the morning. The cornea is now flatter and the eye is no longer seeing nearsighted. Um, when you don't wear the lenses, the cornea will go back to its regular shape and it's still a nearsighted eye. Um, the second one are drops called atropine. And if you put those in every night, uh, those are slowing the progression of nearsightedness as well. And then um, soft bifocal contact lenses, um, probably the easiest, most user-friendly and all of these things are working really well. So eventually we'll have more studies on like, oh, we should be doing this one or that one. And you can use combinations of them as well if things aren't, aren't working well. But 
um, what happens with both the CRT and the soft bifocal contact lenses is they change the way light is hitting the peripheral retina. So with just natural vision, natural contact lenses, we're going to get the light to come in and focus right on the retina, right in the center, in the macula, so that a patient see 20. But naturally, then from there, the peripheral light rays would actually be behind the retina. And that kind of invites the eyeball to grow longer, grow longer. So with CRT and soft bifocal contacts, we're taking that peripheral light and putting it in front of the retina. And that's slowing the progression or the growth of the eyeball. And it's been working really well. It sounds like when kids have a misshapen head, how you put a helmet on to help like coach it into being a, a, a different shape of a head. It's just like that with your eyes is what I feel yeah. like it is with the contact. So it's fascinating, right? Like, oh, well, I mean, and just to back up, I, my mom had hard contacts my whole life. I just remember having to look around for them on the floor, right? Because they're expensive and they can fall out easily. So we've opted for the soft bifocal contact lenses because those are user-friendly. You can dispose of them every month. But this is amazing because I, and you can share if, I don't know what the progression where it is normally with nearsightedness as you get, you know, as you, per, as you go from year to year to year, but I always remember getting worse and worse and worse. No, she's just staying right where she's at. It's kind of, I, it, I think it's incredible. Yes. Yeah. It's, um, it's exciting to watch because, you know, a lot of times when a kid is becoming nearsighted and, and you could look at mom and or dad's prescription and know it was a minus 10 and, and not be able to do anything for them. Um, and now we can't. So yeah, it is very exciting stuff. Um, even if we stop a kid at a minus three or a minus four, you know, depending on where they were genetically predisposed to go and how they're using their eyes, if they're getting outside a lot and stuff like that, if you stop a kid uh, at a minus four, they are a much better LASIK candidate than a minus 10. So when, so there's still, you know, surgical options and stuff, but not everyone with a minus 10 can even have LASIK. And so then sometimes they have to look at other options. So, you know, there's lifestyle effects as well as, um, as the eye disease things that can happen later on, there's quality of life issues that are different for a minus three patient than a minus 10 patient. And you talked about some of the lifestyle things as, you know, being outside, eating and different types of exercise, et cetera, and not smoking. But what are some of the nutrients? I know you carry some nutrients in your office that are evidence-based for improving eye health. What are some of those? Um, the biggies are lutein and zeaxanthin. But there's also, you know, the antioxidants like vitamins A, C, and E, zinc, and selenium. Um, what we find is that blue light damages the retinal pigmented epithelial cells. So that's a layer way back in the retina. Um, when we supplement pig, pigments like lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin, those pigments build up in the retina in front of our pigmented layer and protect it from the blue light damage. Ah, okay. So with these pigments, it's like armor for the... Uh, there's like a, an armor, a colored armor going up, yeah. up in the very back um, to prevent from blue light damage. So if someone's kind of new to blue light damage, why don't you tell us a little bit more about that? What's going on with the blue light? Well, what we found, um, and I'll go back and set the stage for this a little bit again too, but um, when you're young, your light will actually even transmit some UV rays. And so I'll throw this in real quick. It's real important to have UV protection for our kids and stuff. But um, as you get older, the cornea and the lens on the front of the eye really block over 99% of UV, but the blue light still gets in. And what they found with a study at the Paris Eye Institute was that um, this blue light, certain wavelengths of it are damaging to those retinal pigment cells. So Blue light comes from everywhere. It's going to be in the sun, in our overhead lights, and in our screens. Um, what we have concerns about is that we're staring into these screens for hours every day now. Even the kids, um, they're starting to learn on screens. They have their own smartphones. They have their own tablets. They spend lots of hours on them. They look into them pretty closely and get pretty tied into it. And so 
um, we're exposing ourselves to more blue light at a, at a younger age. So we're looking at a lot of protection for that. Is that going to be beneficial? There's good reasons, good theories for us to think that it will be, um, but it'll take a little while for more of those studies to come out. Why, what happens when you've got way too much blue light going on? Like, do you get nearsightedness? Is it just cause strain in different ways? Like what can you expect to happen if you don't take prevention steps? Okay. There's the, there's a, a health hazard from it just simply from damages, damaging the retinal pigment epithelial cells in the retina. Um, that's the same layer that gets diseased in macular degeneration. So will we see more of that in these younger generations? Um, you know, looking at screens all the time. So that, that's one of our concerns. Um, and then blue light is very high energy, very short wavelengths, which means that when they hit things, they scatter more. So um, that was a great question. There's both the health effect and an eye strain effect. So it's not necessarily causing more nearsightedness, but um, it is causing us more strain. So when we filter or block blue light, we have better contrast sensitivity and less eye strain. And that kind of sounds like what was happening to me, which we can talk about what you did for me here in a second. But before that, even when blue light's associated with interfering with your melatonin cycles and sleep, right? And so the guidelines are to not look at blue light so much before bed, which you know what, probably no one listens to. So what else can you do? Um, I mean, I installed Flux. I think it's FL. It's like a free thing on my computer. So at night, my computer looks pretty yellow. Um, And in the early, early morning hours, it looks kind of yellow. You get used to it. And you can absolutely notice a difference. I don't know if you use it. I absolutely notice the difference on how my eyes are looking at the screen for sure. Uh, let's see, what else is there that you can be doing for that? Oh, and then of course, blue light glasses. So tell us a little bit more about blue light blocking glasses and then the extra step up that, um, that you discussed with me and that I am using correct right now. Okay. Um, now when we block blue light with glasses, you're right. You know, blue light is beneficial. We need blue light. We need blue light for our normal color vision. Um, We need it to control those sleep-wake cycles. Um, So when when we block it in glasses, an initial starting point would be about 20%. We're only blocking about 20%. And of that, it's only the harmful um, blue light rays. So we don't block all blue light across the whole, you know, visible blue light spectrum. Um, So blocking parts of that can help reduce eye strain. Um, We think we might be protecting the retina. And then when we do an eye exam, we we can do focus testing. So we set the eyes up close and see how much they can focus, if they want to focus, or if they kind of lag behind the plane where we're telling them to focus. And then also eye teaming, how do they point together? So because when you're looking far away, your eye is relaxed and your eyes are kind of looking parallel, straight. So when you look up close, now all of a sudden the eyes have to turn in and that's a a nerve and a muscle working and your eyes have to focus up close and that's again a nerve and a muscle working. So those things can add to the eye strain. So we'll measure some different things on patients and determine if we should put a little bit of uh, what we call plus power into the glasses. Um, That takes some of the focusing workload off of the eye So you'll still focus up close, see your screen well or your book or whatever it is you're looking at, but the eye is not working as hard to do that. And then also if a patient's eyes don't like to turn in well, if they don't like to, it's called convergence, if they don't like to converge, we can sometimes put a little prism in the glasses that allow the patient to see singly, right? Because we don't want to see double and do that with, with less of that pulling force on the eye muscles. Yeah. And I've been kind of trying to describe it to other people. And like you described to me, it's like flexing your arm, right? Like your, your eye is always flexing, right? When it's looking at a computer and can you imagine walking around flexed all day? I'll just let you soak in that image for a second. And so now it's allowing that flexing to relax a little bit. So it's not so much strain, correct? Yeah. And another thing that happens with that, that flexing focus posture is that uh, screens are, they don't have a a great stopping point for the focusing muscle of the eye. So 
Um, the eye now is having to go from its relaxed state to a flex state. So, you know, if your arm is hanging down, it's nice and uh, relaxed. But if, but if you flex that muscle to per, pull your arm up, you know, that doesn't hurt. That's fine. You're flexing up close. Um, but then an additional stressor on a screen is that your focusing muscle will even juggle back and forth a little bit looking for the focal point. So, you know, if I, if I took a one pound weight and flexed my arm up, that's not a big deal. It doesn't hurt. Now, if I just ever so slightly juggle that back and forth a little bit, it still doesn't hurt. But I can guarantee you if I do that for an hour or eight hours or 10 hours, you know, my bicep is going to be sore and same with the eye muscles. And so people will have a uh, strain around their eyes, maybe even a headache in the forehead and the temples. They get to where they just want to rub the eyes and close the eyes. You know, those kinds of things are the strain. Another interesting thing that happens on the computer is, um, our blink rates go way down. So dry eye is a really big issue. Um, it's just a big issue in general, but it's also a, a big issue on screens. Okay. So say someone doesn't want to get, well, let me back up one second. It's kind of, how do you know you're getting a good blue light glasses? Like how would, how do you know they're legitimate that they're actually blocking blue light? That's a great question, and um, we're really good with that, with UV being able to measure that and stuff like that. And so um, we know with our products, because we trust our manufacturers, um, they're behind the, the studies and the technologies that are helping define it and, and stuff like that. Um, as far as just uh, buying things off the Internet, uh, it, it's hard to say. I, I feel like sometimes when I look at those websites, because patients will ask, it doesn't, they don't give a lot of specs about um, what blue light are you blocking? You know, which wavelengths, which nanometers, how much of that are you blocking? And part of that is okay, because we don't exactly know, well, it should be, you know, this percentage of these wavelengths. We can, we can define the wavelengths pretty well, but as far as percentages and stuff like that, um, we don't really know health wise what we should be blocking, mm -hmm. you know, yellow blocks blue light. And that's why your screen looks yellow. And you remember blue blockers. Those are always kind of yellow glasses. So it doesn't have to be too technical either. I mean, as far as taking the strain off the eyes and stuff like that, to just getting some of those screen protectors, or you can even buy glasses that are less expensive that aren't prescription that will block some blue light and help with eye strain. Some of that's going to be, try it, see how it works. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of like supplements. You, you were describing it. You said, you know, you know what you trust because you know the research and that you trust the company integrity. And yeah. that's exactly how I would be with supplements because there's yep. tons of garbage ones on the shelf. And so you just kind of say, eh, well, I don't know about that. I mean, you just have to kind of do your research. Yep. Uh, let's see. So where was I going with the other questions about this? Oh, yeah. So let's say you don't want to get glasses for avoiding blue light. Maybe you installed flux and you're just looking for other ways to reduce eye strain. What's the other little trick that doesn't cost anything that can help you reduce eye strain? Is it the 20-20-20 rule or something? It is. The, yep, that's exactly what I was thinking about, the 20-20-20 rule. Um, so again, eyes are relaxed when we're looking far away. So that rule means that for every 20 minutes you're looking up close, you should take 20 seconds and focus 20 feet or further. Look out a window, look far away. Ah, excellent. Okay. Looking yeah, out the way. I've been muscle relax and reset and all that good stuff. You know how you can do this? We have some baby ducks at our house and my office window looks exactly into the backyard. And so the past few days I've been looking out the window a lot more watching these baby ducks run around the backyard. So if you find something interesting that you can be <laughs> focusing on, it makes it a lot easier. I bet my eyes are feeling less strained the best. See what's going on out there. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Yeah. So go ahead. Um, I was going to say, that's another thing that will, will happen with the focusing muscle in our eye is um, it, it kind of gets stuck. If, it, if you're looking up close all day long and that the muscle and the lens in your eye has to work really hard to get into this new focused position, uh, a lot of times I'll hear people say, 
then when they look far away, when they drive home after a work day or things like that, their distance vision is more blurry than, than other times. So it just kind of gets stuck and takes a little while for it to reposition out to that distance viewing. And so that's another thing that that 2020 20 rule will help people with. Mm -hmm. I know we should probably find an app for that. Okay. Yeah. One more thing you, we were talking about blue light, but something that's been around forever that maybe we don't have enough press around is the UVA, UV, UVB light damage. And I think you said, as you get older, you get a natural kind of mechanism or defense for that. But when your when your kids are little, you should really be putting sunglasses on them. Right. Am I catching that? Right. Like, like I should go you, get sunglasses for my kids. Yep. Yep. Sun, uh, UVA and UVB protection for kids is really important. And, um, you know, there's always with everything, there's different qualities of things. So you should uh, make sure that you've got hundred percent UVA and UVB protection. Um, and, and beyond that, that's the protection part. You know, if, if you're buying your kids cheap sunglasses, um, it's okay. The optics in them might be a little less than optimal and stuff like that, you know? So, um, just making sure that the protection is really good. Now, that being said, um, of course, especially we optometrists would much rather see people in good optical uh, quality things. We can reduce glare with other uh, blue light mechanisms and other just anti-glare mechanisms. And then with sunglasses polarization. So those things are really nice and we'd love to see kids in them, but I have kids and, and I don't know where those expensive glasses are or they're always on the floor of the car and they've just been stepped on again. So I understand not wanting to purchase expensive things, but I need to qualify the, the adult thing again a little bit because we do get blockage of UV rays into the eye. So back into the retina and stuff like that. But the front of our eye is very susceptible to blue light. Um, so there's going to be, I'm, I'm sorry, UV light we were talking about now. Um, they're going to UV light for, for us adults is going to cause more cataracts, um, pinguacula, which is that growth on the white part of the eye. Um, some people, it looks like a bump. Um, some people have a little bit of a yellowing tint to it. And a pinguacula is very susceptible to dryness and irritation. So a lot of people's pinguaculas will be red or they'll light up really red if they get into a lot of sun or wind, just a dry eye situation. Um, and that it can even grow over onto the cornea, which is called a pterygium. And then of course, you know, you can get cancers on your eyeball, on your eyelids, um, and UV protection, you know, helps protect those things as well. And then we're always concerned about wrinkles. So um, UV blocking sunglasses can help with all of those things as well. Mm, I wouldn't have thought about sunglasses for wrinkle protection, but I kind yeah. of, I kind of just want to say that word over and over, pinguecula, pinguecula. Yep. That is a growth on the outsides of your eye or the, on yeah, it's eye? on the, it's on the white of the eye. Okay. Uh, yep. So that's called the, the conjunctiva. Um, so that would be right next to the to the colored part of your eye, just but right outside of that on the white part of the eye. And and they're they're going to be in between the eyelids. So, you know, if you look down and lift your eyelid, you're not going to get a pinguecula up there. You're going to get it at that three and nine o'clock position where you're getting a lot of UV exposure and, and wind exposure and dryness to the eye. That's where pinguaculas are going to develop. Mm, interesting. So if you've got, if you're getting way too much UVA, UV, UVB light damage, ultraviolet light damage from the sun, you could get these issues or can you also get some of those other problems? Can it also pr provoke nearsightedness? Can it provoke glaucoma? Can it provoke the other eye diseases or is there something else? Just cataracts. Just cataracts. Okay. Gotcha. Interesting. Whew, there's so much here. So we talked today about screen time, blue light, the how myopia or nearsightedness is exploding throughout the world and especially in East Asia. And at least three things that you can do to kind of slow or prevent that. We talked about UVA, UVB damage. We talked about relaxing the focus from uh, looking at screen time or looking at screens all day from the 2020 rule to adding a little bit of power um, to many different things. So there was, and then we also talked about uh, different diseases. So this is kind of a lot for my brain because it's definitely a different space. And I'm really excited that you were willing to share it today. Is there any other gut reaction you have? If someone wanted to know how they could start improving their vision via lifestyle, especially in this digital age, like what would you leave them with? 
Well, you know, a lot of a lot of things with vision are um, you need to think about your vision in the future and in, in tomorrow. So it really ties in with everything that you do because a healthy lifestyle is huge for vision. Um, a lot of times I will talk to my glaucoma and macular degeneration patients about what, what do you do to have good circulation and good nutrients in your body um, and those kinds of things. So uh, the, a lot of the stuff that we do for you right here and now today is more about eye strain um, and, and reducing eye strain so that you're just having a better life. Um, but as far as the future, you know, the UV, the nutrients and exercise and all those kinds of things are uh, there for, there for your, your vision tomorrow and on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Well, uh, where can people find you? I guess if they want to come see you, they're coming to vision source in rapid city. Is that the website? Is there anywhere else people should look for you guys online? Yeah, it's, um, vision source specialists.com and we're on Mount Rushmore road right there in rapid city. That's fitting, right. To be on Mount Rushmore road. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, Dr. Pearson and I have a clinic there and we pretty much cover everything we do. Well, you know, optometrists don't do surgery, but we treat all those eye diseases that we talked about. Um, we help people with prevention. Um, and then we do contacts and glasses and all the stuff we talked about there too. So, uh, what is, what's something that surprises you that people could be doing with their vision or something that surprises you that you're seeing in practice now? Something that I've seen and learned in the last, um, handful, maybe, you know, decade is just noticing that um, people are coming in and presenting with a lot more autoimmune diseases. Maybe I'm paying attention to them more, but it sure seems like I'm seeing more of it. And a lot of these patients are having, um, or they're taking medications for these conditions that can totally affect the eye. Um, some of them can cause irreversible vision loss. Uh, some of the medications, the steroids specifically, can cause glaucoma and cataracts. And the other uh, autoimmune medications can cause irreversible damage to the retina. So we have to watch these patients very, very closely. Um, and then just in my own journey, looking at those things and realizing that there is so much that you can do, uh, just again, for your general health to prevent these conditions, it's it's really important. And so that's been a real eye opener to me. And I, I do take a lot of time out uh, frequently to talk to patients about um, diet and what they can do for their autoimmune conditions. And so I'll refer them a lot to, to you and to other websites as far as, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that we can be doing and, and I know we can do it on our own, but um, we just don't. And boy, that would be a recommendation for me too, is to, to get help because, Again, it, it goes with the future of your vision. Um, there's so much more to it, all the whole systemic health and everything, but the, the future of their vision um, really can be improved by these changes that you can make. But they're very, very hard to make. So that's why I would say definitely get help. Call Krista. <laughs> <laughs> well, autoimmune conditions are really fascinating. I have been, I've studied them for quite a while. I mean, they're growing much like myopia, they're growing at an unprecedented rate where we could just say, oh, they're growing, but they've exceeded what would be normal for growth um, and exceeded yeah. for what would be normal for genetic growth, et cetera. So we know that there's a lot of lifestyle and a lot of environmental influence, et cetera. I'll have to hook you up with a, a post about diet for autoimmune conditions and just like easy things that happen. But I had, a, I had a thought pop into my head. I work with a lot of eczema kids. And one of the things that we've seen or that I, I read somewhere, well, I know about the effects of steroids, at least short term will thin your skin. But I also had seen, um, it must damage the eyes quite a bit as well, because I had seen someone actually in Asia whose child had gotten cataracts from being on yeah. steroids. Yeah. Do you ever see that? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a, it's a real thing that happens. And, you know, it's, it's a definitely, you know, more risky with the long-term use, but sometimes these people are really, really sick and they, you know, that's all they can get relief and they have to use them long-term. So it does happen. 
Yeah. Yeah. It is crazy. Um, again, lots of, lots of lifestyle things in there. And I, my yeah. heart really goes to, I mean, eczema is 10 to 20% of kids, which is an insane amount. So, um, there's yeah. definitely a big, a big area there to help. In fact, um, kind of hoping like in the future to maybe write, uh, like some mini books about it just because like people just, we just have to share information on how you can get that better without so much medication, just because the side effects are not acceptable. Right. Long-term. That's right. Yeah. Boy, if you can just, if you can do it by becoming uh, more healthy, <laughs> then there's other benefits too. Right. So mm-hmm. yeah. Good well, stuff. yeah. I mean, reversing damage and whatnot. So, okay, great. Well, thank you so much again for being so generous with your time because you know, it's just one of those things that people take for granted. It's sometimes the the appointment that people skip until we're already in this pain point, And there's a lot that can be done before that point. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thanks. If you want to know a little bit more about the nutrients that have been shown to be beneficial for eye health, we've included a link to a miniature blog post in the show notes. You can find that there. And there should be another blog post as well about dietary changes that can be made for autoimmune conditions as a first step. If you need help with your autoimmune condition, please feel free to reach out at lessstressednutrition.com. One of the best gifts you could give us at The Less Stress Life is your feedback. We are paid in podcast reviews. If you enjoyed this or any other episode, please leave us a review. In the iTunes store or from your podcast app, just search for Less Stress Life as if you're not already subscribed. Click on the banana face image, scroll to the bottom where it shows the text of other reviews, and write a review. While you're there, hey, make sure you hit subscribe. For Android or Stitcher users, you gotta go to the desktop site and search for Less Stress Life and then scroll down to leave a review. Stitcher doesn't load Apple reviews on their site, so if you want, you can leave a review in both places. Your feedback means a lot to the success of the show. Thanks so much for taking the time to do that. You rock. 